to those were the questions ma'am okay Uh, should we move to the next session then? Uh, any more questions uh, from anybody? How, uh, ma'am? There's one more question. Mm -hmm. How to decide uh, whether to use vacuum or forceps? In what? In uh, like according to the session or in, in mal positions, how to decide uh, vacuum or forceps if the head is not coming out? Head is not coming out and there's a malposition. Again, I'm coming to that same. Check the position, you know, ob oblique uh, this thing. If you are experienced enough to do this little bit of rotation with the forceps, yes, you may try. That's quicker and better as far as traction is concerned. But since vacuum is easier to use and uh, easier to learn also, you can do that uh, also. Again, it will rotate. When you are giving traction, it perpendicular with this. And then you should, you will automatically see in this vacuum. And this one thing is there's a line here, you know? Yeah. This line or a knob in a bird modification, Armstrong, uh, there's a small knob there. This should be applied according to the occiput. This okay. line of the vacuum cup should be facing the occiput. So this is the occiput. Even if it is like this, then you apply it like this, okay? So what will happen is as you are pulling uh, the, the each pull, it, it will show you whether it's rotating or not. So you little bit of uh, this thing is there. So this line, so the, once you, you are pulling it out with one pull, first thing it will it, uh, do is it will rotate the head. Don't try to give friction too much, let it rotate. And then in next contraction, pull it out. So that leads to the success of the, so that's what now you have to correctly identify the occiput, apply it on the flexion point, and then with each contraction, you see the progress. First, the rotation will be corrected, and then the descent will be further. So that's important. Um, next, ma'am, one more question is there. Uh, is instrumental delivery allowed in preterm? Yes, of course, the, if the indications are there, uh, we don't do this vacuum, we can use forceps, why not? If uh, second stage is getting a rest to it, uh, but no CPD or the maternal conditions are there, medical disorders are there, preeclampsia are there, so we can use forceps and deliver. That's a better, you know, that gives a better compression and uh, protective cage to the head of the fetus, so less chances of injury. Um, one more question is there. Please explain cephalic and the pelvic curve again. Okay. So this is the fetal head. And if we apply according to the, and if it is, you know, fetal head is straight. Sagittal suture is in the midline, fully rotated. So when we apply the blades, the cephalic and the pelvic application is the same. But if the head is little rotated, see, I just can't, I don't have an assistant since I'm sitting at home. So this is sagittal suture in the midline, no malposition, no rotation, right? Then this is the, we go straight, then the cephalic as well as the pelvic application is the same. But if there is a little bit of less than 45 degree of rotation like this, Okay, the head is not in this position, same. So if I apply according to the pelvis, what will happen? The head will be little, uh, my blade will come one here and one there, you know? So that is pelvic application, left and right, that's pelvic application, but it is not according to the head. So that is pelvic application. If you apply little like this, one and the, where the sagittus, you have to bring the sagittal suture in the midline and then rotate it. So this is phallic application. You are rotated and then the direction of the pull is according to the type of the head. So that's the difference between for midline position, it's a phallic and the pelvic are the same. For little uh, male position, oblique diameter, we need to apply it according to the cephalic head of the fetus, rotate it and then bring it. So that's the difference. I hope you understand now.
Um, I think there are no more questions. Uh, we can end the session. There's a, somebody has raised hand in faculty. Okay. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Want to say something? Ma'am, name of the Indian forceps, please, ma'am. I'm sorry? Name of the Indian forceps, ma'am. So what we have is this Wrigley is only, no, me, which is available. The one, the this. I, I don't think there's any Indian forces. It's based on that. The Indian and also have started uh, manufacturing it. This is the outlet. She was asked to me in the Viva, ma'am. So <clears throat> you you better find out and tell others also. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> What is it based on the, these no Wrigley's or Simpsons? We have produced our own process. If somebody has given a name, I'm sorry, I don't know. If somebody else knows in the faculty, please uh, let us know. Okay, then. Any more queries? Any questions? Anybody? Hello. Okay, my message is don't use vacuum and transfers arrest. The indications these days are the same almost as the forceps. Otherwise, chances of failure are more. Okay, then thank you very much. I Thanks. think uh, yeah, a lot, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, for the good session. Everybody learned about vacuum and forceps application differently. I guess um, we can, I think, move to the next session now. We'll now move to the next session um, of specimens, um, which will be taken by Dr. Indu Chuk. Ma'am is professor and consultant in RML Hospital, New Delhi, ex-HOD Department of Obzangaini, RML Hospital, uh, executive committee member AOGD 2019-22, uh, executive committee member Narchi 2021-22, executive committee member IH Delhi chapter, um, member endoscopy committee AOGD, Member Endometriosis Committee AOGD. Gynec endoscopy surgery is the interest or area of interest. I'll request ma'am uh, to take our session. Uh, we can see the slideshow, ma'am. Hello. We can hear you, ma'am. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, the whole team, uh, Gangaram Hospital, has done a remarkable job, you know, in doing the refresher course. And I'll be contributing a little. It's not possible. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, ma'am. Audio is clear. So, uh, are the PGs in? Yes, ma'am. So, um, uh, everybody okay. is connected, ma'am. Yeah, there are four PGs and Dr. Kavya, Dr. Charu, uh, Dr. Shaheen, and Dr. Aprajita. So if they can be turned on. Uh, so I can't cover all the specimens, but I'll try to cover the ones which are asked very frequently. So I can't move my slides. How do I move my slides? So, yes. Uh, Dr. Kavya. Yes, ma'am. So, can you see the specimen? Yes, ma'am. So, can you identify the specimen? 
Yes, ma'am. It is, uh, this specimen is of a thick enlarged vascular tissue uh, with vesicular appearance, most probably that of a molar pregnancy and to be specific, uh, probably a complete mole. Okay. So, how does these patients present to the clinician, you know? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, usually they will present with uh, amenorrhea. Uh, followed by complaints of spotting or bleeding PV. And uh, they can also come with complaints of uh, passage of uh, vesicular masses uh, per vaginum. So uh, have you seen any patient with uh, who's coming with passage of vesicles? You know, these days, aren't they being diagnosed early? Yes, they do come with history of amenorrhea, bleeding PV, passage of grape-like vesicles. But now we are moving on to more of first trimester diagnosis. At number of times, you know, we diagnose it in the first trimester itself. You, okay. So uh, suppose you are suspecting on the basis of your clinical history, I mean, amenorrhea, any signs and symptoms which can point out, you know, like symptom you said, signs, you know, on your yes, clinical yeah. On signs, ma'am, when we examine the patient, uh, we can, we, uh, first of all, these patients are uh, more prone to anemia or they can also come with hyperemesis. Uh, and why, secondly, are they, why are they anemic even if they haven't bled? Uh, ma'am, uh, because of the uh, 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 invasive nature of the... Uh, no, they are because, of, because there's a lot of collection of blood inside. Collection of blood, yes, ma'am. Uh, because of the separation from the decidua, when you start the suction, at times you know, see you see that large amount of blood comes out initially. So that's why they are anemic out of proportion, you know, even if they haven't had blood loss. And anything yeah. else in the sign? And ma'am, on uh, pair uh, on pair vaginum examination, we'll see that the uterus size is more than the period of gestation. That you can do by per abdomen examination also. No? Yes, sir. Yeah, the you height of uterus is more than period of amenorrhea. And how do you confirm the diagnosis? Suppose you are suspecting on the basis of history and your signs and symptoms and yeah. Ma'am, uh, we can also proceed to do an ultrasound. Uh, on uh, ultrasound, uh, we'll be able to see uh, 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 vesicular changes, uh, uh, a mass with vesicular changes, which gives a characteristic snowstorm appearance. Uh, but the definitive diagnosis for molar pregnancy would be after suction curettage by histopathological examination. So on ultrasound, you see a honeycomb appearance, cystic uh, spaces, and there's no fetus. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a complete mole, there'll be no fetus. And the whole of cavity would be occupied by cystic spaces. And it is at times called snowstorm appearance. So, uh, and if you can see a fetus, then what's your diagnosis on ultrasound? Like Mom, if, if there's... Yes, ma'am. If there is a fetus uh, and along with that, there is a, uh, we see that there is a vesicular or hydropic changes in the placenta, then it is, uh, the diagnosis will be more towards a partial mole. And um, similarly, then we can confirm the same on histopathological examination. Any other difference between partial and complete mole? That um, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, first, uh, uh, on the genetics is different. Complete mole is usually a dispermy and uh, di uh, di are usually deployed and partial moles have uh, triploid uh, genetics. And then uh, complete moles are, uh, they will consist of a complete vesicular uh, mass with uh, which are seen to, uh, uh, which are seen associated with thecal uterine cysts on ultrasound and uh, uh, on the other hand, partial moles will be able to see embryonic tissue or a fetus with the focal hydropic changes okay, in the okay. So once you have uh, seen that it is a complete H mole, and what is the next step? Ma'am, next would be that uh, we will have to uh, terminate the pregnancy by suction curettage. Uh, the ideal so investigations be... you would order before uh, suction evacuation. What? Investigation yes, should be ordered, you know. Ma'am, we would get uh, a complete blood count and a uh, ABORH, LFTs, KFTs, a baseline beta HCG, a thyroid profile for this patient. Yes. Along with that, we can also do a chest X ray. Mm, suppose her hemoglobin is 7.5. Yes, ma'am. What would you do? Ma'am, we would also arrange blood and uh, we would uh, like to uh, transfuse blood. 
build up the patient uh, first uh, and patient more than eight gram actually you can give blood in the ot you know because yes, you give blood anyway she's going to bleed a lot it's better to give blood in the ot take her to ot complete the process and and then yes. what number cannula would you use for the suction evacuation so, ma'am uh, 14 uh, to 16 ideally we should be the largest size uh, possible we should use uh, because it will lead to a uh, faster removal of the uh, molar the uh, conceptus and less bleeding uh, will occur if we use a bigger cannula so ideally 14 would be the size yeah 12 to 14 otherwise you'll take a lot of time and she'll keep bleeding you know so yes, uh, what is, what is the role of prostaglandins oxytocin can i give her misoprostol in the morning you know to facilitate my process what is the yes, recommendation yeah Ma'am, the latest uh, RCOG recommendations are that prostaglandins can be used for cervical priming, uh, uh, ripening, uh, pre-procedure. That is, uh, three hours before the procedure, we can give uh, prostaglandins. But for oxytocin, it is not recommended to be given before the procedure, although it can be used post-procedure or while uh, suction curettage is happening uh, because it will not only help in decreasing the blood loss, it will also help in uh, making sure that there is completeness of uh, removal of the product of conception. So, yeah, contrary to what we used to teach about 10 years back, things have changed recently in last two, three years. You can use prostaglandins, mesoprostol in the morning. It will facilitate your dilatation and suction evacuation. And oxytocin, you can start when you are completing the process of evacuation. That is 2021 guidelines. So we can use, you know, we don't want the patient to bleed. Yes. So, uh, and once you have completed the process of evacuation, how do you follow up these patients and why do we need follow up? Ma'am, we need follow-up because there is a risk of persistence of the disease uh, or conversion to uh, a GTN, that is a new plasia. So uh, we will do a weekly, first we'll do a weekly follow-up with beta HCG until we have three recordings of a normal beta HCG. And uh, thereafter, we will have, we will do a six monthly follow-up. That is once a month, a patient will have to come for the next six months uh, and we will check the beta HCG. The latest RCOG guideline says that uh, within 56 days of uh, the suction uh, curettage, uh, if the beta HCG has come out to be normal, then we will follow up the patient for another six months with weekly beta HCG. And if it takes more than 56 days, then from the time when the beta HCG comes out to be normal, uh, that time onwards, six more months, we have to follow up the patient. So uh, when does one stop follow -up? Yes, ma'am. If uh, once the beta HCG has uh, come out to be normal for three readings, uh, that is three weeks consecutively, then uh, we have to continue. You already told me, yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And now she wants to know, she was a primary gravida and she landed up with this. When can she plan her next pregnancy and uh, should we allow her immediately or give her some time? And uh, if not, what is the ideal contraception? Yes, ma'am. So we have to uh, counsel the patient that she should ideally not get, uh, uh, not conceive again within one year of her last molar pregnancy. So in the meantime, in that one year, we have to give her contraception, which would ideally be oral contraceptive. So uh, a combined oral contraceptive pill for that uh, time being would be the best option in, in her so, case. So let's see, you know, in cafeteria approach, she wants copper tea or mini pills. Uh, can we use copper tea? Ma'am, uh, copper tea is, uh, we have to avoid copper teas in uh, molar pregnancy because there is a risk of uh, uh, either uh, uh, embolism of the uh, uh, molar pregnancy and uh, or it, it is a MSC, it comes to MSC uh, category four in. Uh, so we need a contraception which is, has very low failure rate. It will not uh, hinder with your follow-up. If you put a copper tea, every time she'll come to you, I have a spotting, same, same with mini pills, you know. So what I feel ideal contraceptive will be OC pills. And uh, you tell her not to become pregnant. And uh, when next time she conceives any special follow, okay, let's finish this first. Uh, so if she has persistent uh, disease, you know, or uh, GTN, what are the chances that she can develop GTN after a molar pregnancy? 
in a complete mole mom there is 15 to 20% uh, that she can uh, end up with an invasive uh, disease uh, so that's why we have to check for uh, we will have to when we check for the follow up in during the follow up we have to check for persistence of uh, the disease uh, which can be either checked uh, we, which can be either seen as a 10% increase in the uh, weekly beta hcg or there is a plateau uh, of the beta hcg value for 3 weeks continuously or after 6 months she still has a uh, beta hcg which has not come to normal or uh, directly by histopathology if we have a confirmed uh, on histopathology it has been confirmed that she has some kind of uh, gtn yeah, uh, at times, you know, we forget to collect the histopathology report. If that, it comes as choriocarcinoma, you have to give that. Then you don't wait for beta HCG. So either yes. it plateaus or rises or at the six months, it's still positive or choriocarcinoma. Those are the indications. So well done, Kavya. We move on to the next thing. We can have questions at the end. So that's for Dr. Shaheen. Is she logged in? Yes, ma'am. Please describe the specimen. Yes, ma'am. This image is showing the cut section of a hysterectomized specimen of uterus, cervix, bilateral fallopian tubes, and right side of ovary, showing a submucosal large fibroid. Which the is ovary is also there, maybe not in the scene here, but she both ovaries were removed. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Mm -hmm. With a large submucosal fibroid of FIGO stage around one and well encapsulated, hold appearance with degeneration. Uh, with multiple intramural fibroids. Okay. Uh, what could have been the presenting symptoms in this patient? You know, like she's got a submucosal fibroid also and she's got a intramural fibroids also. So what patient, do you think about the... Yes, patient may present with complaints of abnormal uterine bleeding in, in which may be heavy menstrual bleeding or prolonged menstrual bleeding. Uh, any pre pressure sim symptoms, anemia because of heavy and prolonged menstrual bleeding. And for infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss, ma'am. So if she had recurrent pregnancy loss, I wouldn't be doing hysterectomy, you know. So I'm asking you, what would have been the presenting symptoms in this patient, you know? Okay. So maybe your next, uh, so can you guess the age of the patient? You know? Yes, ma'am. Be because in this patient, ma'am, uh, bilateral salping of rectum is done. So patient may be more than 45 year of age, 45 or 50 year of age. So are you trying to say that if uh, the patient is 48 years, you will do the ophrectomy? Ma'am, patient should be uh, postmenopausal, ma'am, in this. Let's say 50. So what, are, what are the latest guidelines which say that when should ophrectomy be done? Suppose she has uh, no high risk factors, no family history, and uh, then uh, when should we remove the ovaries? What are the guidelines? Eh? Anybody else wants to chip in? Dr. Charu? Ma'am, the ovaries are active till about uh, uh, 15 years of age after the menopause also. So even if the patient is uh, postmenopausal and uh, is having no high risk factors for ovarian carcinoma, we can leave the ovaries. Yes, I feel like uh, there's no need to remove the ovaries at 48, 50, even if she's achieved menopause. Unless she's got high risk factors like family history of carcinomas or others, then of course, you know, when you are doing hysterectomy, you'll remove the ovaries, you know. Yes, so uh, uh, these days, you know, Shaheen, we talk about uh, opportunistic self-injectomy and prophylactic self-injectomy. So what is opportunistic self-injectomy, you know? Ma'am, opportunistic salpingectomy, when we pay, when we are doing any pelvic uh, surgery for the patient and there is no risk factor for ovarian carcinoma, in this patient, if we do the salpingectomy, then it is opportunistic salpingectomy. And if patient is having a risk factor for ovarian carcinoma, then uh, if we are doing the salpingectomy, then it is prophylactic salpingectomy. So one must understand. And these days, all of us are doing opportunistic salpingectomy. Why? Why are we doing opportunistic salpingectomy? Um, to decrease the chances of ovarian carcinoma. So, does it decrease the ovarian reserve? Uh, yes, ma'am. Is then then that means you are losing the functions of ovary. So, uh, we can do opportunistic self injectomy. One has to be careful. Like, uh, if you remain parallel to the ovary and don't go too much into the mesocervix, because ovary has dual blood supply. Okay, so. Uh, the ovarian reserve in most of the cases is not alter altered if you are careful while doing opportunistic uh, self injectomy. But yes, with this trip, it's prophylactic self injectomy. Little difference, you know. 
So yes. thank you very much, Dr. Shaheen. Well done. So uh, we move on to the next case. Uh, this is for Dr. Charu. Yeah. Uh, describe the specimen, you know. Ma'am, this is a cut open specimen of a uterus with cervix showing bilateral tubes and bilateral ovaries with the endometrial growth, uh, which uh, can be uh, endometrial carcinoma. So why do you say it's endometrial carcinoma? I say it's a fibroid. Ma'am, because it is irregular in appearance, it is uh, uh, showing degenerative changes in between with irregular not world appearance, it is not well encapsulated, it is irregular in growth and surface. Okay. So, uh, what are the high risk factors, Dr. Charu, for development of endometrial carcinoma? Like, which patients are more prone to develop endometrial carcinoma? Ma'am, patients which have a prolonged... Uh, uh, estro unopposed estrogen exposure, for example, a patient with PCOS or in history of infertility, early menarche or late menopause, uh, obesity of the patient, hypertension and uh, uh, tamoxifen intake, uh, HRT intake, or if the patient is having a family history of ovarian carcinoma and certain genetic mutations which have increased predominance of endometrial carcinoma like, uh, uh, like Lynch syndrome. So what percentage of endometrial carcinoma are hereditary? So, uh, 90 percent, uh, uh, about 90 percent of endometrial carcinoma are sporadic. Uh, 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 genetic predisposition can be found in about five to ten percent of the cases. Ten percent, huh? so about ten percent. Yeah. So, uh, how do these patients present, and what is the age group at which they present? You know? Ma'am, generally they present in postmenopausal age group and the presenting feature is postmenstrual uh, post bleeding. And uh, it can also present as uh, um, uh, because of uh, cervical stenosis in postmenopausal patients, it can also present as hematometra or pyometra. And in case it is in a, a premenopausal female with high risk factors, it can also present as abnormal uterine bleeding. Yes. So, uh, no, before, uh, what are the high risk factors for disease? Okay, before the we that we go to go back. So we say, you know, we have to be uh, before doing the surgery, we have to calculate high risk factors for disease recurrence. So can you name just theoretically what are the high risk factors for disease recurrence, you know? Ma'am, if the patient is having a tumor which is large in size, for example, more than 2 cm in size, and if the myometrial involvement is more than 50%, if the patient is having lymphovascular invasion, positive peritoneal cytology, if the patient is having endometrial carcinoma, which is not endometrioid type, or having uh, P53 mutations, then all these uh, are the high chances of recurrence. So, uh, we are giving a lot of importance to lymphovascular space invasion these days, you know. So, what do you understand? And... What is the word substantial LVSI? You know? Ma'am, lymphovascular space invasion is defined if the, uh, as the patient is having more myometal involvement, the more vessels around the tissues will get involved. And uh, when we take a histopathological specimen and we uh, stain it with hematolysing and uh, oxalin, and we see the vessels having the tumor emboli, if the less than four vessels are having tumor emboli in per uh, slide that we have examined, then we say it minimal invasion. And if more than four vessels are Saru, involved, Saru, can you stop? Can you stop? First, define uh, when we de when we say lymphovascular space invasion. Invasion it is beyond the tumor. You know, within yes, the sir. tumor, no, it's beyond the tumor. When you see the invasion, it is called LVSI. Yes, it can be minimal, it can be focal, or it can be substantial. For substantial, how many should be there? And more than four vessels should be involved. More than four vessels in per uh, slide that we examine. Yeah, a lot of importance being given to this because the uh, lymph node involvement is much more if LVSI is substantial. Okay. So we, what are the, uh, which is the classification system we usually are we have been following? Ma'am, uh, generally we use a classification system based on histopathology that differentiate into non-endometrioid and endometrioid carcinomas. That is type 1 and type 2. Huh? That uh, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 being endometrioid and type 2 being non-endometrioid like serous and papillary mixed squamous cells, uh, undifferentiated types. And in... Uh, Another classification that uh, is done nowadays is the molecular classification in which the histopathology along with the, um, um, genetic mutations are studied in the specimen and then it is divided into four types. First of all, we do the uh, pol DNA pol mute mutation. If it is present, we uh, label the uh, carcinoma as DNA pol mute. 
and if it is not there we go for uh, defective mismatch repair uh, sequences like msh1 mlh1 mlh2 mlh6 if these are uh, present then we label it as defective mismatch repair then we go for p53 if it is present we label it as p53 wild and if it is absent we label it as p53 uh, aberrant so a uh, lot of importance is for post graduates and in fact the recommendations are that it should be incorporated in the system but most of the labs do not have uh, testing uh, facility for doing these mutation tests. But yes, we are still sticking to the old, but postgraduates should be aware that if she's P53 positive, then. Ma'am, then the oh. chances of poor prognosis are high. We yes. generally have uh, uh, poor prognosis, larger stage, more grade three tumors, and uh, uh, they occur at a um, later age group in um, uh, thin patient, postmenopausal patients, and they have the worst prognosis. So postgraduates must read about molecular classification because a lot of importance is being given to molecular classification and alters the prognosis. So what are the treatment modalities and should we be doing a, a lymphadenectomy in all cases? What are treatment modalities? Ma'am, it has a surgical treatment is there and uh, we have a radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So how do you decide? Yeah, how do you decide? And if the patient is having early stage of tumor, then we go for uh, hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy and uh, pelvic lymph node dissection. And uh, so how do you decide pelvic lymph node dissection? I mean, I'm, if the should it be done in all cases? No, ma'am, it is not done in all the cases. There are few uh, cases in which the lymphadenectomy should not be done. Like if the tumor size is less than 2 centimeter and there is no lymphovascular invasion, there is no deep mimetal invasion, uh, mimetal invasion is less than 50%. And uh, in all these cases, and the tumor is only grade 1 or grade 2, and it is endometrioid type. In these cases, we need not do a, a lymphadenectomy. And uh, uh, in, if any of the following is not present, then a lymphadenectomy should be done. So, uh, G1, early stage tumor, no myometrial invasion, endometroid. Okay. But if the same thing is serous or clear cell or any other undifferentiated, then irrespective of the size, irrespective of the myometrial invasion, you have to do lymphadenectomy and you have to do omentectomy also. For endometroid, there is no need to take omentral biopsy or do omentectomy. And for late stages, okay, carry on with the treatment. Ma'am, in uh, stage, uh, later stages, along with surgery, uh, we also go for uh, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Like in stage 3 and stage 4, along with uh, 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 surgery, we have to go for external beam radiotherapy and uh, uh, chemotherapy. Okay, uh, we hear a lot about sentinel lymph node biopsy. What is it? What do you understand by sentinel lymph node? I mean, sentinel lymph node biopsy, we give endocyanine dye at a 3 and 9 o'clock position in the cervix. And then we wait for some time for the uh, dye to spread to the draining lymph, first draining lymph node. And if we are able to see the uh, first draining lymph node and we take it out and we sample it for fresh portion section and we see if there is involvement of uh, uh, tumor uh, microinvasion in these lymph nodes. In case it, it is there, then we go for uh, uh, removal of the sentinel lymph node. So, what is the advantage of doing sentinel lymph node biopsy? Why not do lymphadenectomy straight away? Ma'am, because lymphadenectomy is associated with um, uh, morbidity, um, future morbidity in these patients. It increasing in uh, per op, it increasing the operative time, and in post op, it increases the morbidity to the patient, like uh, lymphedema uh, formation. Uh, so... Okay, so a lot of importance is again being given whether you do it by laparoscopic or by laparotomy. So can I operate it laparoscopy? Suppose it's early stage. Can I use minimal invasive surgery for endometrial? Yes, ma'am. Minimal invasive surgery can be used in these case patient, ma'am. If the patient has in stage one uh, or stage two um, tumor of grade one, two, and also in grade three stage one tumors. So what about ovaries? You know, should ovaries be removed with endometrial carcinoma, and why? Ma'am, if the patient is uh, premenopausal and the tumor size is less than uh, 2 cm and the patient is only stage 1A, uh, my metal invasion is less than 50% and she is a premenopausal female with no other high risk factors for ovarian carcinoma, the ovaries can be left. No. For postgraduates, ovaries have to be removed with endometrial carcinoma only in exceptional cases. Why do we remove the ovaries in endometrial carcinoma? Ma'am, because in 3% to 5% of the cases, there is coexisting tumor in both endometrium and ovaries. Yes, and it, there could be secondaries also. So, for postgraduates, ovaries have to be removed in endometrial carcinoma. 
only in young patients, uh, endometroid, G1, if patient wants, then you have to explain the risk to the patient. Only under rare circumstances, we preserve the ovary in cases of endometrial carcinoma. Otherwise, we generally remove the ovaries in endometrial carcinoma. So can you elaborate more on adjuvant therapy? Like suppose she's endometrioid G1, early stage, and uh, should I give uh, adjuvant radiotherapy? No, ma'am. Uh, if the patient is uh, uh, stage 1A and uh, grade 1 or uh, grade 2, and less than 50% myometrial involvement is there, and it is endometrioid type, then adjuvant therapy need not be given. And in all the other cases, when the patient is intermediate or high risk, then adjuvant th uh, therapy is given in the form of uh, uh, vaginal brachytherapy or external beam radiotherapy and chemotherapy with the carbo uh, uh, carboplatin and paxitexel. Yes. So uh, in early stages, if you are doubtful, and if you have the facilities available, you can do molecular uh, uh, look for mutations. And if it's pole mutation positive, then there's you no need, need to give adjuvant therapy. It's, if it's P53 positive, then adjuvant therapy should be given to these patients. Or intermediate, then one has to calculate. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Charu. So Thank you. next we come to Dr. Aparajita. Is she logged in? Yeah, I can. Yes, ma'am. Okay, there are yes. two specimens. First, describe the left one and the right one, and then why I put two. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, there are uh, two specimens in this case. Uh, the first is all uh, a specimen of cervix with uh, ma'am uh, the posterior part of it I cannot see. So I, I I'm uh, of the opinion that this is only uh, cervix, which uh, suggests that uh, with a uh, growth on the anterior lip. Uh, which is um, exophytic in nature, it is irregular, and it is uh, showing uh, areas of uh, hemorrhage also. So uh, this is likely a specimen of uh, following a tracheolectomy. And on the right, there is a specimen of uterus with cervix, with vaginal tissue and parametrium as well, which shows an exophytic growth, which is occupying most of the cervix, more on the posterior lip than the anterior, and it appears to have areas of necrosis and hemorrhage as well. So it is likely a uh, post-hysterectomy. So what is your diagnosis? Uh, Ma'am, uh, my differential diagnosis for this specimen is uh, the first di uh, DD is uh, cervical carcinoma. It could also be uh, tuberculosis or uh, uh, because it is an exophytic growth, it can also be condyloma accumulator. But because of the area uh, of hemorrhage and necrosis, the, this diagnosis is less likely. It yes. could also be an, an uh, infected uh, cervical uh, polyp. Ma'am. But looking at the growth, it looks like carcinoma cervix, but one must keep very rarely tuberculosis and condylomas in mind. You know? Okay. So how do they present and at what age group do they present? Ma'am, the most common presenting features for such patients would be uh, vaginal bleeding, which is irregular. And uh, it may be post-coital or uh, post-menopausal as well. The patient may also complain of uh, malodorous, watery vaginal discharge. And if the disease is advanced, the patient may also have uh, weight loss or bowel and bladder complaints or uh, ureteric obstruction. And uh, the, um, uh, the uh, ages in which these uh, commonly present are bimodal, uh, two bimodal peaks. That is 35 to 39 years of age or 60 to 64 years of age. Yes, very good. In India, we generally see bimodal peaks, you know. So uh, suppose there's a growth and uh, how do you go about, uh, how do you confirm the diagnosis? Ma'am, uh, if there is presence of an uh, obvious gross disease, we can directly go in for a cervical um, biopsy. And if uh, the growth is small or there is absence of any uh, uh, growth, gross disease, then we can go in for a colposcopic guided biopsy and an endocervical keratage. To so make, in this uh, case, you can see the growth, you know? Yes, so, so direct so biopsy. So should I do the staging at the same sitting or should I wait for the investigations? Ma'am, uh, we can uh, the we can clinically stage the disease in this case and then we can uh, supplement it with our uh, pathological or radiological findings. So, uh, so commonly uh, investigate further with uh, either uh, MRI or CT, but uh, MRI has better contrast resolution for soft tissue. So we could go in for an MRI for this patient. So till about 2009, the staging of CA cervix was only clinical. Only you know? clinical. And then uh, like imaging, you could get, uh, uh, do, but you couldn't upstage the disease. But latest figo 2018, what is the recommendation now? Uh, um, as per recommendation, now we can supplement our clinical staging with 
uh, pathological and radiological findings um, uh, with respect to the tumor size and the extent and the status of the nodes that can be upstaged uh, after the imaging. And we have to uh, denote with uh, R for uh, radiological and P for pathological. Uh, yeah, suppose a uh, patient, I'll give you an example. Suppose I operate on a patient uh, who was early stage and on MRI, uh, suppose I see lymph nodes positive, then she moves on to the, which stage will she move on? If the lymph nodes are um, positive? She will move on to stage three, whether it is pelvic or parioitic that can accordingly. So if my uh, MRI is showing that it is uh, lymph nodes positive, how will you write the stage? Ma'am, it will become stage uh, 3C, uh, mm -hmm. the R. R. Respect, if it can be 3C1 or 3C2, if it is pelvic or parioitic, and then mm -hmm. R can be added because it is uh, radiologically proved. So this thing, postgraduates must know that you can upstage the disease after you have done surgery and after you get the pathology. Suppose uh, on pathology, I get the lymph nodes positive and she was early stage when I operated. Then she goes to stage. Ma'am, again, uh, if lymph nodes are positive, then she goes to stage three. And how C. do we write it? How do we write it? It's th stage three C. Uh, C1 or C2, respectively, for uh, whichever lymph node is positive. And what, what do you add? P for pathological grade. Yeah. So you are supposed to write P for pathological and R for? Radiological. And wh what did you say is the modality of choice to know whether uh, how much is the local spread? And for local sp uh, spread, because uh, MRI has better contrast resolution for soft tissue, uh, MRI can be used. But if we want to know the status of uh, the lymph nodes, then uh, CT is a better modality. So for local uh, growth, it's better to have MRI. But if you are looking for distant metastasis, then maybe CT. And if you have facilities available, then PET CT is the best you know, for these cases. Okay. So... Uh, this we have already discussed. Does imaging result change of staging? Yes, now yes. it can. So uh, what are uh, treatment modalities? And first tell me what are different types of hysterectomy and how do you decide? Uh, Ma'am, uh, the uh, different treatment modalities in this case can be uh, dependent on the stage of the disease, the cl uh, clinical status of the patient. And uh, uh, in uh, if it is early stage, then uh, we can uh, see the st uh, proper staging, what is the FIGO staging. If it is 1A1, we can go in for a type 1 or a type A hysterectomy, which is a simple uh, extrafacial hysterectomy. And if the patient wants to preserve her fertility, then we can go in for a conization or uh, trachelectomy with pelvic lymphadenectomy. If it mm. is higher than that, it is 1A2 or 1B1, then we can go in for a type 2 hysterectomy or a, um, a, a type B hysterectomy, which is a modified radical hysterectomy. With can, pelvic, you, can you elaborate, uh, Dr. Prajita? Yes, ma'am. What is modified radical and what is radical? What are the differences between two? Ma'am, in modified uh, radical, uh, we have to remove the complete uh, uterus cervix. Uh, ovaries may be preserved. The parametria is uh, removed at the uh, level of the uh, ureter. The uterine vessels are ligated uh, at the level of the ureter. The uterosacral uh, ligaments are uh, divided midway to the rectum. And the vaginal cuff is additionally removed one to two uh, centimeters, up to one to two centimeters. Whereas in uh, radical, we have to uh, remove the uh, parametria uh, lateral to the ureter and uterine vessels are ligated at the, up uh, to the pelvic wall for removal of parametria. Yes. Yeah, you'll go up to the pelvic wall. Pelvic wall. And uterosacral uh, ligaments also, ma'am, uh, yes. till the uh, sacral attachment. And the vaginal cuff is also removed uh, up so, to one third or one fourth. Ma upper one third of vagina should be removed. Yes, ma'am. So a number of times we are doing these days modified uh, radical hysterectomy. What is Vardheim's hysterectomy? We use a number of times Vardheim's hysterectomy. What is Vardheim's? Vardheim's is uh, type 2 or B. Okay. So yes, uh, suppose patient is, uh, let's say, 42 years. Will you remove ovaries in her case? You know? And suppose she is a, she's confirmed case, CA cervix, early stage, and... Ma'am, we do not uh, need to uh, remove the ovaries in this case. If she does not have an additional uh, ovarian pathology, then the ovaries can be preserved. Yes, ovaries can be preserved in a young patient if you are doing radical hysterectomy for CA cervix. But it should be moved out of the pelvis so that if she needs radiation later on, you don't cause her premature menopause. So, and Abbas, last question. Uh, 
we have uh, radiotherapy, chemo radiotherapy, and surgery. You know, suppose uh, uh, for stage early stages. I mean, what is the prognosis between uh, if I do surgery or if I give primarily radiotherapy? Is there any difference in the survival rate? Ma'am, in the uh, early stages, uh, it is, um, they have uh, similar outcomes and uh, in terms of survival and in terms of morbidity. But if the uh, stage is locally advanced, then uh, concurrent chemo radio is uh, supposed to be better than uh, surgery or dual modality because it increases the morbidity. Because uh, there's a young patient, you know, let's say 39, 40 years, you know, and I have to choose. She's early stage and I feel the prognosis is going to be same. Should I choose surgery or radiotherapy? Ma'am, if it's a young patient, then we can uh, go in for uh, surgery because it will also help in uh, ovarian preservation and we can um, uh, uh, position the ovaries in, uh, high up in the paracolic gutters in case she needs post-op uh, radiotherapy. So surgery would be a better option for a younger patient, ma'am. So what are side effects of the radiotherapy? Ma'am, it can cause uh, sten uh, vaginal. Uh, uh, it can cause uh, stenosis, and it can cause uh, um, um, decrease, dec decrease ovarian reserve. So it will cause premature menopause also. Plus, there's a lot of fibrosis after hysterectomy. You know, in a young patient, uh, uh, she'll have dyspareunia, she'll have urinary symptoms, she'll have bowel symptoms. So, in a young patient, if you feel the results are going to be same, it's better to choose surgery. If, and it should be done by a competent person. Onco surgery should always be done by a person who's well trained and not by any green. So, so yes, regarding yes. removal of ovary, we have already discussed. So, do we have time or we stop here? Because I finished one round and second is another five minutes. Do I have five minutes? Um, no, ma'am. Uh, actually, we are running behind. So, sh uh, should I stop here? Um, yes, ma'am. We'll have to. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the interactive question answer session. Uh, I hope the PG is because of the less time, you know, I yeah. planned it this way. Otherwise, I couldn't have covered even a single. Yes, yes ma'am. It was that. very interactive and uh, the students also answered really well. Um, I will thank you for uh, organizing such an interactive session, ma'am. Uh, any major questions? I can't actually, I, we can't actually take, ma'am. So sorry. <laughs> so thank you again, Mala and the whole team for including me in this program. Thanks, madam, for your all your cooperation. We <laughs> had a really nice learning session from your side. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm really sorry for the Saturday Friday. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Okay. So <laughs> uh, we'll move to the next session now. That will be taken by Dr. Sumitra, ma'am. Uh, now we'll uh, have a session on CTG that will be taken by Dr. Sumitra, uh, Sumitra Bachani, ma'am, uh, professor and senior specialist of uh, VMMC Safdarjung Hospital, faculty fetal medicine and genetic clinic, um, SJH Hospital. Uh, good uh, evening, Dr. Anuva. I think we are short of time. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah. yeah, I understand. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mala, uh, Madam, for this uh, opportunity. I try to share the screen. Unable to share. There's a, a icon, ma'am. Uh, in the, I think uh, it's being shared. It's not yet.
Sorry, I don't know why I'm unable to share with some issue. Dr. Sumitra is having problem in joining. No, no, ma'am, I'm there, but there is some issue sharing. sharing. Okay, okay. The okay, screen. Okay. I don't know why. Oh, okay, give me a minute. I'll try. Um, you could try refreshing. I'll just rejoin in half a minute. Yes, ma'am. We can see the screen, ma'am. Okay, really sorry for this. Uh, now is it visible? Yes, ma'am. The slides are visible. Uh, so I've gone full screen. Can you see it? Full screen? No, ma'am. Not the full screen. Okay. Now? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So really sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much for waiting. I was trying to save time and so I think this is the last one and uh, I'll keep it uh, short and crisp. Uh, so CTG is the cardiotopograph, right? And so that is basically a graphic recording of the fetal cardiac activity and the uh, maternal uterine activity. And that comes in a graphical form. So unlike this picture here, now uh, it has really evolved and now we do have you know wireless CTGs 
and the mother need not be bound like this to the bed however uh, there are a lot of concerns about the uh, you know this electronic fetal monitoring so in case of a low risk pregnancy a current recommendation is that uh, intermittent auscultation is good enough so in the case of uh, you know in the first uh, stage of labor maybe every 30 minutes in the second stage every 15 minutes and after a contraction one can do intermittent auscultation using the our age old stethoscope so what about the uh, electronic fetal monitoring then which women should be offered so currently it has been seen that uh, you know the continuous electronic fetal monitoring will reduce the incidence of neonatal seizures but it has failed to show any benefit in decreasing the perinatal mortality or cerebral palsy at times the interpretation of this monitoring is unsatisfactory because there are definitely you know uh, observer variations errors in interpretation however currently it is the best modality till now uh, for monitoring the fetus during labor however it should be remembered that ctg is not a substitute it is basically an add on to good clinical observation and judgment so you know nothing can re really replace that so uh, ctg can be used as an admission ctg maybe continuous maybe intermittent depending on uh, the uh, lady's uh, condition uh, should one do admission ctg in all cases well not really recommended for low risk pregnancies however in our country and especially in our public hospitals we do find women coming in unbooked unregistered and uh, they may be carrying a growth restricted baby so uh, in that case uh, admission ctg becomes important so one needs to use that judiciously right and uh, there are various other uh, indications uh, i need not go through this list i'm sure you all have it in your books and you must have gone through it that uh, these are the indications where definitely we should be using ctg as an adjunct going further uh, what is most important is that you know we all kind of do it but before you know you must remember that this is a medico legal document it is to be taken seriously because uh, in in the days of you know litigation a ctg will be the maybe a something which will can save your back so considering it as a medical legal document ensure that it is gps you know coordinated your date and time are the the way it is as per the gps and uh, it should be accurate like you must be make sure that the date and time clocks are set correctly then uh, one must label the traces uh, of course the these uh, traces will not have the woman's name because of privacy we, you know we have not taken those sections but the woman's name should be the lady's name should be there her hospital number and uh, then the date and a part of her condition like if if she, if there is uh, you know if uh, she is an ivf conception she is pre eclampsia then one needs to mention those risk factors and uh, remember that these traces you may have to you should be saving them for the next uh, you know 25 years and maybe in some cases where there is a concern that the baby may experience developmental delay electronic uh, storage may have to be done even indefinitely we know about we may we you must all must have also read about the uh, medico legal cases which have been there off and on based on these uh, uh, neonatal conditions who have developed cerebral palsy so uh, as i said that it is important to uh, you know record everything now the uh, the important thing is the uh, speed of, on the paper like you know with what speed you are running that paper so here it says 1 cm per minute usually that is what the setting is sometimes for saving paper you may be running it at 2 cm or 3 cm then you have to be aware that you know at these speeds your variability will change and see how the trace the same trace will change once the speed on, of the paper changes so uh, whatever speed you are setting it at you should be knowing that because that's how because at 1 cm this box is 1 cm so you can very well you know easily on eyeballing uh, you know just count the boxes 10 boxes and then you know it is 1 uh, cm per minute so 10 boxes would be around 10 minutes now the prerequisites for doing the ctg one must be clear that uh, uh, you must uh, know that you know what is the lady's condition she is uh, being augmented with centosanon she is a previous cesarean section so the reason that you are going to you know put the ctg on her uh, explain to the lady what you are going to do uh, 
the lady it's very very important that she should be in the upright position or lateral recumbent or half sitting please don't do ctgs in supine positions and uh, you know you, uh, you very well know why you shouldn't be doing it in a supine position you can write the answers in the chat box so uh, determine the lie and position of the fetus and always check the maternal pulse so sometimes you know people have picked up the maternal pulse on an iud and uh, you know the trace is there and everybody is happy about it but actually that was the maternal pulse so check the maternal pulse check the fetal heart don't take the probe all over the patient's abdomen with the jelly you know trying to look where the fetal heart is identify with the fetal doctor and you can put the probe there so these points you should keep in mind and that's how you should proceed with doing the ctg and then you you know you'll find that it is convenient for you as well as for the lady uh, the this talk is basically based on the rcog guidelines uh, there are the acog also uh, they are similar except that they categorize their ctg as you know category 1 2 3 so then that one can use as per the institution where you are working otherwise this is good enough and uh, if you know this you can even you know use this uh, in your exams so uh, the ctg should how should one be assess assessing the ctg that is very important one can use this mnemonic drc bravado so drc bravado dr uh, stands for define the risk as i said that there can be a maternal risk there can be a fetal risk a maternal risk could be you know preeclampsia hypertension abruption she is diabetic or it is a preterm uh, you know pregnancy then uh, it it is you know she there is labor augmentation going on or uh, she had experienced decreased fetal movements then there could be certain fetal indications to uh, uh, fetal indications uh, risk factors such as you know growth restricted baby a preterm baby there is meconium stain like uh, there is oligoamnios you know or there is it's a multiple pregnancy so likewise define the risk because you will read the ctg in holistic manner where you will consider the risk factors also then uh, look, uh, define the uh, see look for the contractions is she in labor is she is, is she getting contractions uh, you know it, either the number of contractions and then is it you know uh, uh, is it in three, more than 5 in 10 minutes so is there a st hyper stimulation which is leading then to fetal distress look at the baseline rate i will show you how you measure the baseline rate the variability so what is variability variability is that the beat to beat the, the fetal heart rate changes and why does that happen because there is a balance uh, the the autonomic nervous system has the sympathetic and the parasympathetic and we know that the sympathetic is for the for 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 fight and flight you know so so that is what it takes care of in parasympathetic is the quiescence so there is a balance between the two and that is what you know changes the uh, that is what causes variability the variability also depends on the uh, likewise on the fetus's sleep pattern so the presence of accelerations which is very we are very happy the fetus is very happy there is some movement and the heart rate goes up more than 15 beats and lasting for more than 15 seconds we are happy to see that uh, although the absence of acceleration is is not a non reassuring feature we must remember that then presence of decelerations now there are various types of decelerations we'll be coming to that when you be early a variable or late and then the overall impression so this is how when you look at all these features you are you will be able to arrive at a conclusion that what exactly you need to do when you are looking at a certain cardiodopograph so as i was saying that there is a fetal behavior state you know which is also known as cycling what is cycling cycling is that you know the fetus may be having quiescence which is like deep sleep there is a very stable baseline there are no accelerations and there is borderline variability followed by an active sleep which is a more frequent state and there you will find moderate accelerations and variability and wakefulness is actually rare and and uh, wakefulness is categorized by a large number of accelerations and a normal variability so this is the fetal behavior cycle so cycling happens in a normal healthy fetus cycling is reduced in a preterm fetus as i said that the preterm fetus the autonomic system is still not mature so this is something which you will see in a term healthy baby now if i come to the heart rate and uh, how do we measure the heart rate fetal heart rate is you have to look for the uh, you know uh, segments of up to 2 minutes or so in the ctg where uh, you know there is a you can make a straight line 
uh, through that heart rate pattern. So uh, when you are looking at this straight line, it is over a period of two minutes, you can then measure. So it is corresponding to around 140. So this is around 140 beats per minute. So you can say over a period of 10 minutes, maybe in the next two minute segment, it was 150. So you can say that the baseline heart rate is between 140 to 150. And you know what is normal between 110 to 160, 161 to 180 becomes non-reassuring and beyond 180 it becomes pathological. So uh, this is how you should look at the fetal heart rate. Take your time because usually the time when we do the CTG is around 20 minutes and you may have to do an extended CTG, of course, if you're finding some non-reassuring pattern. And uh, this is how you will look for so these segments and uh, measure the heart rate. And uh, what is tachycardia? So anything above 180 uh, would be fetal tachycardia. So here you can see, you know, this is constantly this, this, our rate is at this position. So this is in fact even more than 180, somewhere around 190. So that is fetal tachycardia. We'll come to the various conditions where there is fetal tachycardia. Then variability. How does one measure the variability? You can draw two parallel lines. Don't measure the accelerations or the D cells. Just uh, along that, you know, the baseline fetal heart rate, you can put two parallel lines. Sometimes on eyeballing only, you can make out, see how many boxes. So as I said that you must know your chart. Your one box corresponds to one centimeter and vertically, the, how much like between 160 to 180, if you're finding two boxes, then that means this is 170 and this is 180. So this is around 10 beats. So likewise, you can calculate the number of boxes and convert it into the number of beats and you have your variability. And normal variability is between five to 25. And uh, increased is of course more than 25, reduced is less than five. And there are various other patterns like a sinusoidal pattern where you will find no variability at all. And there is also what is known as a pseudo sinusoidal pattern because if you go very close to this pattern, you will see that no, there is some degree of variability here. While in sinusoidal pattern, there is absolutely no variability. It is just like a smooth sine wave. So, uh, if you go back to RCOG, that will tell you about the, the white and the amber and the red that, you know, normal is 5 to 25, amber is less than 5, lasting for 30 to 50 minutes or more than 25 up to 10 minutes. And likewise, red, you can compare that, you know, uh, less than 5 for more than 50 minutes or 25 beats, more than 25 in more than 10 minutes and sinusoidal pattern. So you can easily decide that, you know, which category it is falling into once you have been able to measure the variability. Now the decelerations, there are various types of decelerations, the early, the variable, the late, and then the prolonged. So there are various causes and there are various types. And I think you all are very familiar with it that the early decel doesn't bother you so much because it starts, it is like a mirror image of the contraction. You know, the uterine contraction is there and then the, there is this mirror image, which is the early decel, it, it, it comes with the contraction, the uh, nadir is with the peak of the contraction and it goes away, it, it recovers as the contraction goes away. So likely cause being fetal head compression, causing increased vagal tone. And as I said that the vagus is responsible for quiescence, uh, the heart rate goes down and it recovers along with the contraction which passes away. So we are not really much bothered about an early decel. What about variable D cells? Now, variable D cells are, again, you know, uh, they are not related to the contraction and uh, they may happen at any time. But most of the variable D cells, uh, they quickly, there is a D cell and there is a very quick recovery. So within 30 seconds, the D cell is recovering, right? So in that case, uh, what is the reason for these kind of D cells? So as we know that uh, variable D cells occur because of cord compression. So what happens during cord compression? Initially, it is the umbilical vein, which is thin walled, which gets compressed. And that leads to hypotension, that leads to baroreceptor activation. And, uh, you know, so that kind of causes this, you know, this, this small peak that you see before the D cell happens is sh shouldering. So this leads to tachycardia. Then what happens? Then following this D cell, the uh, artery, the umbilical artery recoil is much faster. So with that, we have the second shoulder. So shouldering is actually a reassuring pattern of variable D cell. So look for shouldering. When you are looking at the CTG and you are looking at variable D cells, look for the shouldering and you will feel reassured when you see the shouldering. That means the autonomic system is intact. This currently 
the hypoxic insult is not there the I, the whole idea of doing the ctg is that you identify the fetus be before you know it becomes acidotic so if it, if there is an hypoxic insult you will identify and you will see that it has recovered very fast that is good but if it is not recovering that means it is going to the third stage which is the acidotic stage and that is what you need to prevent so here in this case you will find that there is a rapid recovery and this is with shouldering and these these are the variable this is the pattern of the variable d cell and this i have already told you that without shoulders it becomes more worrying and this suggests that the fetus is becoming hypoxic so this is one point you can look for so what do you think which variable d cell will then cause concern should cause concern as i said that they recover very fast but if the recovery is taking longer it is taking say more than 60 seconds more than a minute or there is reduced variability within the d cell you find there is no variability see here it's a straight line you know this variability which you see here is no longer there so if there is reduced variability with the d cell it is lasting for longer and the failure to return to baseline see it is taking so much longer to return back and there is a biphasic w shape and there is no shouldering so this all these goes in feature of concerning characteristics of variable d cell so when you look at the d cell from now onwards you will quickly be able to identify does this d cell have any concerning characteristics or not right so these are the things you should be able to look at so as i so as we go on from acceleration to decelerations to early to variable to late now so late decelerations are of more concern why because late decelerations tell us about utero placental insufficiency so in this case it is a chemo uh, a receptor mediated response which means that the fetus is moving from hypoxia onto acidosis so late decelerations we need to give more importance and we need to also analyze them properly so these are what how what kind of d cells they will start once the peak of contraction is over so they will start after that and they are very gradual in onset and gradual to return to baseline so it is taking like more than 30 seconds elapses from beginning to the end of the nadir so this is actually the nadir so this is a chemo receptor like as i said the chemo receptor mediated response and one needs to see how much long this d cell is persisting because there is something which is known as a very prolonged d cell anything more than 2 minutes becomes a very prolonged deceleration and that is an ominous feature so now we have discussed all the types of you know features of the types of decelerations their features and now we come to understanding that amongst these what are non reassuring d cells and what are pathological uh, which will cause e even more concern so non reassuring decelerations are variable decelerations which are which have no concerning characteristics they are perfectly fine they have shouldering they have variability but they are lasting for more than 90 minutes so then it becomes a non reassuring feature similarly variable decelerations with any char concerning characteristic which i have shared with you like you know absence of shouldering presence of w loss of variability then in that case these characteristics if they are present up to 50% of contractions for more than 30 minutes then it is also a non reassuring feature so you must also look at the con the d cell as well as its relation to the number of contractions so if there are say 10 contractions and if there are you know more than 6 variable d cells which means they are lasting for more than 50% right so that case again it becomes a cause of concern so variable d cells with any concerning characteristics in over 50% of contractions in less than 30 minutes late decelerations in over 50% of contractions for 30 so late decelerations are important even if they are present in over 50% of contractions but less than 30 minutes because usually we are running the ctg for 20 and then we find something then we run it for another 10 minutes or so you know and then we we do an extended ctg so then we are able to see the time that how much longer these are happening and for how many contractions the relationship with the contractions is also important whether it is more than 50% or less than 50% likewise what are pathological so as i said pathological would become something which is associated with any other risk factor so variable decelerations with any concerning characteristic in over 50% of contraction for 30 minutes or less than 30 minutes if there are any risk factors so risk factors i have already you know discussed with you so presence of risk factors adds to the it makes it 
more to, moves it more towards being abnormal or pathological. So it is very, very important to analyze the CTG with the presence of risk factors. So lay these cells for less, lesser than 30 minutes with any of the maternal or fetal clinical risk factors. It is growth restricted. It is preterm. There is presence of meconium. So all these things then adds to it becoming pathological. Or a single prolonged deceleration lasting for three minutes or more is again a pathological deceleration. So uh, sometimes, you know, we people have kept this chart next to the machine and you may not be able to remember every time that, okay, what was the feature? But uh, it's there next to the machine. And of course, as students, of course, you must know it. So you can go make a chart yourself and just, you know, keep looking at it in between just to revise and you will be able to remember these things. And the last pattern is the sinusoidal pattern, which is a sine wave. I've seen many of the people, you know, our students reporting this, that, you know, there are D cells. So these are not D cells. You see, there, there is complete loss of variability. And this is an undulating pattern with a cycle frequency of three to five minutes. And if it is lasting for more than 20 minutes, because I said that there is a fetal sleep state also, and sometimes the fetus is just sucking. So all those at that time, so you may find, you know, this kind of a sinusoidal pattern. So wait, wait for 20 minutes. And then, you know, more than that, if it persists, then you have, it becomes a cause of concern or else if it is associated with any risk factor, suppose there is abruption or it is an RH isoimmunized pregnancy, then obviously you know that this is a case of fetal anemia. Then you don't have to wait for that long, right? So uh, this is the chart, very easy, ready recorder. You can refer to it and uh, you can keep it bedside next to the machine. And you know, you will, once you are doing it routinely, you will just remember it at the spinal level. So what are the causes when we are looking at? So if we are looking at a fetal tachycardia, what should come to my mind? So should come to my mind is, is there maternal tachycardia? Is there maternal pyrexia? Or there is chorioamnionitis, some infection in the mother, uncontrolled hyperthyroidism. Mother is on some medications, maybe beta myometics, right? Or as I said, fetal anemia and very important fetal arrhythmias. So sometimes you would find that, you know, fetal supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, and that is uh, not really a case of fetal hypoxia. It is a case of fetal arrhythmia, which one can, which one needs to identify in the antenatal period. Similarly, there are various reasons for bradycardia. And if there is a bradycardia, one must look, if it is an acute event, then you have to look for three important things, for prolapse, rupture, or abruption. These three things should immediately come to your mind and you should be doing a per, per abdominal and a per vaginal examination whenever you find that there is an acute uh, uh, bradycardia. I'll be showing a few, uh, sharing a few, uh, you know, CTGs with you and you can tell me that what, you know, that uh, CTG implies to you. So various, even simple conditions like maternal vomiting, use of a bedpan, or she has been just an epidural has been cited. So in these conditions, because there is a sudden hypotension once you're given an epidural, so that can also uh, lead to bradycardia. The fetal condition, one must also always remember fetal heart blocks presence of rolla antibodies leading to fetal heart blocks, which you will have a continuously low fetal heart rate. And uh, so then at that time, uh, if it's an undiagnosed case, something like this should come to your mind. Then uh, variability we've already discussed and one must remember two important things, mat self and dexamethasone. So, you know, that definitely leads to reduced fetal variability. Moving further, so, you can categorize your traces as normal, which means all features are reassuring. Mind you, again, absence of accelerations does not make it non-reassuring. Suspicious, which means one, non-reassuring and two, reassuring features. And pathological, which means uh, one, abnormal feature or two, non-reassuring features. Or you can categorize as per ACOG if you are more comfortable with that. So... In the management of these CTGs, it should always be a holistic approach when you are looking at the uh, mother's uh, antenatal condition in the presence of um, uh, maternal or fetal risk factors. So in case there is no hypoxia, it is a reassuring CTG, which means the baseline is you know, appropriate to the gestational age. There is normal variability. There is fetal cycling. And there are no uh, deceleration, repetitive decelerations, then you may not even do a continuous monitoring and you may decide when you want to review the case. In cases of chronic hypoxia, where there is you have a growth restricted fetus, what would you find? You would find that the fetal heart rate is higher baseline than expected for that gestational age. There will be reduced variability or absence of cycling, absence of accelerations, and presence of shallow decelerations. 
So that time consider other clinical indicators also if they are present like reduced fetal movement or there is meconium or there is antepartum hemorrhage or the mother is having evidence of chorioamnionitis that will add on to your clinical decision of that this baby is chronically hypoxic then you will have to expedite this delivery if the delivery is not imminent. Uh, is not imminent. In cases of gradually evolving hypoxia, you may find that the baby is either compensated or decompensated. So if it is compensated, what we do find? So variability, as I'm stressing again and again, that please look for variability. With normal variability and a return to baseline, even if there are decelerations, that is basically a compensated hypoxia, which means that the baby will respond to conservative interventions. If the baby will respond to your intrauterine resuscitation. So you need to perform the intrauterine resuscitation and regularly review this every 30 or 60 minutes. Here, you don't need to jump in and you know expedite the delivery or, or prepare the patient for cesarean section. So this is very, very important that you need to look at the variability and the stable baseline despite being preceded by decelerations. What is decompensated? Decompensated means there is a reduced or a very high variability, like you know more than 25. And this, uh, there is a progressive decline in the baseline. So then you just looking at these two features, you can see that this baby is decompensated. There is uh, you know, hypoxia and the baby is not able to compensate for that. Then you have to intervene and expedite the delivery. In case of subacute hypoxia, you will find there are more D cells are more, and they may be associated with saltatory pattern. So at that time, again, you know, you evaluate the case. If there is oxytocin going on, stop the oxytocin, and if there is no improvement even after stopping oxytocin, so mind you, uh, uh, around in 15 to 20 minutes, almost 25 percent effect of the oxytocin wears off, and in half an hour, complete effect also wears off. So in, the, in that half an hour, if you have been able to perform the resuscitation and you think that, and you see that, that you know, the baseline has come back and uh, the variability has come back, then in that case, you may just continue to observe. But if suppose uh, she's in the second stage of labor and there is no improvement, then you need to again expedite the delivery. Lastly, a case of acute hypoxia. This is very, very important. Uh, mostly while doing the CTG, you will find that there is a sudden drop in the fetal heart and it is remaining like that for more than two minutes, three minutes and longer. Then the three minute rule, the rule will apply. So what is that rule? First, exclude three important reasons that is called prolapse, abruption and rupture. And if these three are present anyway, you need to expedite the delivery. If there are some reversible causes, you can perform the intrauterine resuscitation and then in the next three minutes, you have to see that if the resuscitation is happening properly, then that's fine. But if it is not, then you may have to think of preparing her for OT. So I put up a case. We will you know, discuss that in that case too. And lastly, if you're unable to ascertain the fetal well-being, there is a poor signal, you are not certain, then you must refer to someone senior. You can perform adjunctive techniques like you know, fetal scalp stimulation or fetal blood sampling. Uh, those are performed uh, in very few places, but the uh, the you know the uh, disadvantage is that these are not real time. CTG is going to give you the real time picture, but this fetal blood sampling you that is uh, at that moment what you have sampled. You don't know what has been happening previously. However, these adjuncts can be used, and uh, that's how you can evaluate and you can always refer to someone senior. So coming to these uh, CTGs, uh, would somebody be able to answer in the chat box or in the Q&A, Dr. Anuga? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so this is the first CTG. So can someone tell me, does this look very reassuring? And uh, what is something is missing in it? So one first thing is tell me what is missing. And second, do you think this is a reassuring pattern? Is this a normal CTG? Uh, how do I see the chat box? I can't see Dr. Anuga. Oh, yeah, I can see it now. Okay. It's it's uh, in the lower uh, most uh, lower corner. Middle. Yeah, middle sorry, corner. yeah, 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 I got it. So Priya said no baseline. Pallavi is saying no baseline. Uh, no baseline. No, there is a baseline. But Pallavi, you're right. There's something wrong with it. Okay. so. Uh, uterine contractions are missing. Okay, they have not added. She is not getting contractions. Okay, fine. 
but have you all seen can you tell me what is the baseline fetal heart rate in this case are you able to see see it is between 80 to 100 have you seen this so the first thing which you see is you know the baseline so here this is a straight segment uh, what would you see you see that this is sorry yeah so actually the baseline is 90 you know 90 and there are few accelerations and we are very happily looking at it so this is actually the maternal pulse so this was a case of iud and uh, somebody picked up the maternal pulse and so so this is this is not the fetal right so that's why you see here it is very much persistent at 90 and so, so this was actually a case of iud with med so please look at the baseline you know so here the baseline was pretty low. Okay, we move to the next one. Wait, yeah. So the next one here. So these these are two. Uh, you know, these you can compare these two. Uh, this is a first CTG where you are seeing variable D cells, right? As I told you, you know, there is no relation to the contraction. The D cells are coming. Uh, so this is a low risk primary. She was at six centimeters, and this is a primary with FGR at five centimeters. On so similar five six centimeters primary gravida, but here the fetus is growth restricted. So there is a difference between the two. Which one you would intervene, and which one you wouldn't intervene, and you would simply observe. So. I don't see any answers there. Uh, okay, maybe the time is also short. So I think maybe I'll go ahead and I'll tell you. So here you will see that there is variability in these D cells. Can you see? So these, this is this is one reassuring feature. You know? What do you see here? There is a W. So this W becomes a non-reassuring feature. The other thing that you have to evaluate is what? That this is a growth restricted fetus. The fetus is already compromised in utero. So where would you like to intervene? This you would still observe. You know, a low risk primary, you, this one you would still observe. This one you would think of expediting the delivery. So that is the difference. How you have to evaluate the CTG based on the maternal characteristics and fetal characteristics. And then you look at the pattern of these, uh, of the babes. Okay, so you look for variability also, type of diesel, look for variability, see the pattern, the W pattern. So this becomes again, a non-reassuring. So moving further, so look at this. What do you see? So there are contractions here.
Well, can we start next session? Uh, yes, we can start the next session. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for the elaborative session on CTG.